morning, everyone. So we started this series last week. We're looking at tough statements of Jesus that, that we, we look at, and if we're honest, they make us say, man, I really wish he hadn't said that. But in the end, we, when we really find the full meaning of what Jesus is asking us and what he really wants from us, we're going to find that we're actually, in the end, we're actually happy that he did or we're glad that he actually said them. We started off last week with what I said was probably the, the toughest of the statements that we'll look at, deny yourself and take up your cross. We don't like to deny ourselves at all, do we? In fact, in this society, in this culture, we want everything that we can for us, no matter what it does to somebody else. But what we found last week was when we do that, when we deny ourselves, when we take up our cross and follow Jesus, that in the end we gain so much more than we could ever do on our own, right? While none of these are going to be easy, that's kind of the whole point of the series, that these are tough things that Jesus asks us to do. While none of them are going to be easy, the one that we're going to deal with this week kind of ranks right up there with the one that we did last week. I said last week that that was the toughest one, then I started studying for this one, and I'm like, okay, this one hurts just as much, if not maybe a little bit more. Let me ask this to start off. Have you ever had someone in your life that just seems to hate you no matter what you do? Maybe it's because you did something wrong to them at some point and they just couldn't get over it. Maybe you didn't do anything and they just, for whatever reason, they just don't like you no matter what you do. You can't get them to change their mind. I had a, something similar to that happen to me when I was in fifth grade. I, uh, I was in a class that was uh, half, half of the class were the smarter end of the, the, that grade, and then we had some of the, the kids that were challenged in that class. And they partnered us up with uh, those that were, were better learning, were partnered with some of the ones that, that had trouble to, to kind of help them along. Well, the whole year I had this one kid that was seated next to me that would continuously pick on me. Just no matter what I did, he just continuously poked at me and picked on me to the point where he was physically poking me in the side all the time. Now, I ended up doing what my dad taught me to do, which was I ended up hitting him. Was that the right thing to do? Probably not. But at, at the time, it stopped the problem at least. But it didn't seem to matter what I did. didn't matter how much the teacher was told. My parents even went and had a conference with the teacher. She continually set this kid next to me, and he continually picked on me the whole year. In fact, the only time I have ever been sent to the principal's office when I was in school was because of this kid. We were walking back from gym, and he runs and jumps on my back, and I kind of turned him into a wall to get him off of me, and that got me sent to the... I didn't get in trouble, but that was the only time that in the whole time I was in school that I ever got sent to the principal's office. I never did anything to this kid, yet just constant constant bullying. When I was uh, out of ministry for a little while, I was working at Lowe's. I was in the uh, returns department. I ran the returns counter. And because of that, I was considered a cashier. Uh, the direct supervisor of cashiers were called head cashiers. Well, we had this one head cashier that seemed to really like me. She always talked well about me and to me. And then come to find out towards the end of my time there, I found out from another supervisor that behind closed doors and when I wasn't around, she constantly just talked bad about me. I don't know what it was. I don't know if she thought I was threatening her job or what, but she just constantly talked down about me to anybody that would listen when I wasn't in the picture. There's just some people that are always going to treat you like they, they don't like you or they hate you. We're dealing with the statement from Jesus today that we're to love our enemies. The first thing we need to do in that scenario, though, is we have to define who our enemies are. First and foremost, we as Christ followers should try to live at peace with everyone. In other words, we shouldn't have enemies that we call enemies. Paul writes in Romans 12, 17 through 19, he says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath, because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. As long as it depends on us, we're to live at peace with everyone. That's, that's a hard statement in and of itself, isn't it? But it ties in with what we're talking about. So again, who is our enemy? It really should not be anyone that we don't like or, or that we have grudges against. All we're talking about here really is people that have a problem with us, whether we have given them a reason to or not. But maybe we're getting just a little ahead of ourselves. So to truly define what Jesus meant by enemies, let's go to our main text for today. We're going to be looking at Luke 6, verses 27 through 36. And this is part of Luke's recording of the Sermon on the Mount. Luke 6, 27 through 36. It says, But I say to you who listen, love your enemies... Do what is good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other one, offer the other also. And if anyone takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks you, and from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. Just as you want others to do for you, do the same for them. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For He is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. So going back to the question, who is your enemy? He tells us right there in verses 27 and 28, the first two verses, who our enemies are. Those that hate you. Those who curse you. Those who mistreat you. But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend expecting nothing. Do you see this description, why they hate us? Or why they hate you? Do you see anywhere in there why? Jesus doesn't tell us. He doesn't go there. He just says that they're our enemy by their attitudes towards us. Not anything that we may have caused it, we may not have. He is just defining them as our enemies because of their attitudes toward us. That means we as Christ followers, again, should have no enemies. But that there will be some that treat us like enemies. He says, I will have enemies, of course, in the sense that I will have people who hate, who curse, who mistreat me. But I'm not to hate, curse, or mistreat anyone else. That's hard, isn't it? I mean, that in and of itself is hard. It would at least be bearable if we could stop there, though. I can live with not hating or not cursing or not mistreating someone. But sadly, Jesus isn't content with merely the absence of negatives. He calls us to more than just that. He calls us to love our enemies, not just not treat them poorly, but He calls us to actually love them and to want what's best for them. He says, if your enemy hits you on one cheek, then give them the other one too. He says, if someone takes your coat, then let them take your sweater or your shirt as well. Whatever they demand, give it to them and do not pursue them to retrieve it. Those are hard statements. I don't know anyone that gets hit that says, okay, go ahead and hit me again. But we have to understand who and what Jesus was talking to. Jesus said this in an occupied country. 
He's speaking to Israelites. He's speaking to Jews who are being occupied and oppressed by Rome. These were definite things that they were all familiar with. Rome asserted their power from time to time. They had to to keep control of things. It means they didn't always treat people nicely. But when we read that, we realize that he is saying this to a Jew who may have just been struck by a Roman, offer your other cheek. It kind of flies in the face of what we would expect, doesn't it? We're taught to defend ourselves. We're taught to look out for ourselves. And Jesus is saying, offer the other cheek. If they want to take one thing, let them take two. And don't expect anything in return. If anyone else had said this, if anyone else had written this, we could ignore it. But it's only because these words come from the lips of Jesus that we cannot ignore it. We ignore them at our peril and at our eternal loss. So what is Jesus getting at? Our primary response to those who see themselves as my enemy is to do good to them to bless them, and to pray for them. Again, tough. (laughs) Not something that I do naturally. And believe me, I'm stepping all over my own toes today much more than probably anybody else in this room. But you notice something here either, or also, He doesn't just say to endure them. He doesn't just say to get along or just to, to endure them in the end. He doesn't ask you to just passively get through this. He says, but to actively seek to bless them. Bless your enemies. He goes into what we call the golden rule in this as well. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. And at that core, we don't want people just to tolerate us, do we? We want people to love us. We want people to do what is good for us. And He's calling us to do the exact same thing to others, whether they do it to us or not. Jesus is calling us to radically distinct behavior that challenges people at an instinctive level. In each of the situations that Jesus presents, we're called to do what would be least expected. It's not only don't hit back, it's offer the other cheek. It's not just let them take your cloak, but it's let them have your tunic as well. And Jesus does not tell us to just give to everyone who asks, but He commands that we don't demand back what has been taken. Completely opposite of the culture and the society that we live in, isn't it? This is not just mere compliance or becoming a doormat either. We're not talking about just letting people walk all over you. This is radical enemy love that calls to actively engage in behavior that will challenge what people have done because it asks fundamental questions about life and about human identity. In other words, people expect us to lash out. People don't expect this kind of love. If you looked into this culture especially, but even today, a slap on the cheek was more of just an insult. It wasn't really physical harm. Think about it. If you're really trying to hurt somebody, are you going to hit them with an open open hand or are you going to hit them with a clenched fist? So we're not talking about somebody that's trying to do physical harm. It's an insult. It was a demeaning gesture. Someone dismissing you as a lot lower than they were. So in offering the other cheek, it's not giving in to physical violence. You're showing indifference to the insult. In other words, that insult means nothing because you don't take up for that. Allowing them to take your tunic and your cloak is not being a wimp and just laying down. That's outrageous generosity. Not demanding back again, is not lying down and playing dead, you're showing that life is not defined by what you have. 
It's a completely different model of what it means to be human. See, those things that matter so much to everyone else, our reputation, rights, possessions, actually mean so little to you if you're following Jesus here. And Jesus modeled this. That's the thing that I can say about all of these things. He modeled this. He's not asking us to do anything that He didn't do Himself. Think about it. He was slapped. He was beaten without without retaliation. Sorry, I lost the word retaliation there. He was slapped. He was beaten without retaliation. He was stripped of all His clothing, with all of His possessions, without uttering a complaint. He had His entire life taken. Yes, He willingly gave it up, but He didn't demand it back when He could have. He's calling us to be human as He was human. Now, obviously, He's going to do it a lot better than any of us ever could. I get that. But He's still calling us to strive to be human in a way that He was human. Not loving our enemies and not seeking their good is actually disobedience. That was hard for me to understand and get my head wrapped around. It's actually disobedient if we don't love our enemies and want what is good for them. But it is so much more than just that. It's being less than God made us to be. If Jesus is our definition of true humanity, of what we are striving to be, then not loving our enemies is being, in a sense, less than human. Why? Because if we don't behave in this way, we're actually acting as though Jesus never existed. He said in verses 32 through 36 of Luke 6, looking back 32 through 36, He says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do what is good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For He is gracious to the ungrateful and evil." Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. He tells us right there, it's no credit to us if we only love those who love us. Because everybody does that. We're to be loving of those that don't love us as well. Loving our enemies means two things. First, that we are people for whom status, reputation, possessions, and rights have no hold. And second, that we have been changed to the very core of our being rather than merely modified at the margins of our existence. So our status, our reputation, our possessions, our rights, while we can hold on to those things, are not what defines us. They're not what ultimately matter. And we've been changed to the very being of our core. Instead of just on the surface, we have been changed to the root. So do you want to be like everyone else? These questions I I sincerely had to ask myself, and it hurt. So I'm just preparing you that. Do you really want to be like everyone else? Do you really want to live life with Jesus as just a side piece? Do you want to behave as though what Jesus was and did has no substantial bearing upon how you live your life and the kind of person you are? You see, if we know anything at all about King Jesus, of course our answer is we don't. If we know anything about King Jesus, we don't want to live like that. So why do we act as if Jesus' words don't matter? You see, here's the thing. We can risk everything that this life has for us. We can risk everything because in Him we already have everything we truly need. 
But how? How do we do that? And he tells us again in verse 35 and 36, he tells us how we can answer that question. He says, But love your enemies, do what is good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for He is gracious to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. Those two verses tell us two answers again to the question of how. How do we live this out? First, we realize that we live for an age to come. We don't live for today. We live for eternity and reward in eternity. He said in 35, Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. We become His children. We become God's children when we live this way. And the second, we're to respond with active mercy. We're to respond with active mercy to the active mercy that we have already been received, that we've already been given. In other words, we act with mercy because our God is merciful to us. See, in a sense, we were all enemies of God at one point. And it's only through Jesus' blood on the cross that that enmity goes away. But God reaches out and is merciful to us even when we didn't deserve it. That is what He is calling us to be to other people. Love your enemies? Yes, very hard statement. But in the end, I'm glad He said it. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you've never accepted His blood, then that enmity between you and God is still there. What better day to get rid of that than today? Any decision you need to make, now's the time to do so. So we stand and sing, Without Him, number 504.